people afford those teachers. <laughs> I thought no. I had started that. Thank you, whoever asked me that. Um, and all the great stuff we missed. No, uh, so that would be the the issue. And it just became available, I think, in January or, what, or July 1 was when we could start it. I think the real thing that we are learning as a negotiation team is that we need to uh, organize around this uh, with our with our legislature. We That's where the real push is going to get is that uh, we get those people to make some actual mandates so that uh, and hopefully funded mandates so that we can have smaller class sizes or some reasonable class sizes. Anyone else? All right. The next question is, what did the district initially offer percentage wise for salary increases? Uh, the district initially offered four and two. With uh, a 10.5% 10 10 increase on health insurance in the first year and 5% uh, increase on health insurance in the second year. Can I follow up to that? Yeah. My, my question. Um, so the four and two, and I know you had come to Dakota Hills one time and you had said that they had said that's kind of the average at one point four and two point something or whatever was offered to us. And you had replied, well, District 196, not average. So you had responded with a much higher number. Um, I, um, you said you couldn't tell us that number, but I'm just curious, like if it was four and two and it was a much higher number, but we still ended with four and four. Seems like if it was a much higher number, you know, was there negotiations back and forth? To, how Absolutely. Did it get to four? How did it, if they started at four and two, how did it get to just four and four if you, you know, that's, had like a higher number. That's what the, Thank you. so, so th you're welcome. So the school board decides. The school board met long before we started, well, I don't know exactly when they met. <laughs> before we started negotiating, the school board met and set parameters for what the negotiations team, there are two school board members on the negotiations team, but they don't, um, they don't have the right to go above those parameters. So the school board set their parameters at um, four and two plus uh, the 10 and a half percent and 5% on health insurance, which I just wanna say does not cover the entire health insurance increase. A 10.5% increase is to the district contribution. So that just means the premium increase is split between teachers and the district. It wouldn't mean no health insurance increase. It would just mean a smaller one than what we settled for. We countered with five and five. Well, we started higher than that. Then we came down to five and five with 10 and a half and 5%. And, um, and then at, and um, and then we, you know, we said we can't settle for that. It's not going to pass. And they said, OK, we'll go back and tell the board what we think we can do. And they came back and said, this is what we can think we can do. If we go higher, we're going to have to start cutting budgets and cutting teachers. I think, too, uh, one thing to note is when um, with interest based bargaining, you know, it's not where we're going back and forth like this. But when the when they made us the original four and two. Um, they made it very clear that that was the highest the board thought they could give in good faith. They believed that that was their absolute highest at that time was four and two. So I don't know if that helps you, but they didn't, it wasn't like they came in with like, we're going to, you know, we're going to give them this and we're going to go back. They came in with what they thought was their highest that they could offer. And they believed at that time. They probably still believe that the highest they could offer was four and two. That was their high. I think the other thing to note is that the that the school board is extremely conservative, and they hire a superintendent who has those same shares those same views, and then they hire a finance guy who shares those same views. And so, you know, I mean, they approach this from a really conservative lens, and they're not looking at taking a lot of risk. The budget advisory council is also very conservative. I've sat on that for a while. They they have teachers on that. They have uh, members of the community on there. And um, I was on it four or five years ago. Constre extremely conservative, um, and they're they don't think um, outside people don't think about 
teachers getting five and five five percent and five percent raises. That's that's outside. They that's not affordable. So uh, for us to get four and four uh, is why we thought it was the best thing that we could get, and that's why we uh, brought it to the members for a vote. The district four also four because we move money around. Yeah, yeah. The um, district also comes to us with a dollar amount, not a specific necessarily percent. That was their idea. But everything we negotiate um, has, well, many of the things we negotiate has a cost to it. And so they deduct that from what our total package is going to be. So there are additional monies that are put in in all of the other TA items that we have um, that all count towards the total package. If that made sense to people who weren't on the team. And the next question is, do administrators have their own contract? Have they settled what was their insurance or what was their increase in salary slash insurance? Yes, administrators have their own contract. No, they have not settled to my knowledge. So uh, I will, I, I don't, I can't remember who I've said to what, but I'll, I did hear from worksite reps who say, the paras are telling us they can't settle till you settle. That is not true. Anyone can settle in any order. Uh, but everybody likes to wait for the teachers to settle first because we're the ones who fight like hell and try to get as much as we can. So the other bargaining groups sit back and wait to see what we get. Um, it is a very circular bargaining pattern. And so trying to decide who goes, for, who is actually first and who is later is tough. But to my knowledge, the administrators have not settled. Um, the next question is why 0% for longevity pay? And, Excellent. Go ahead, yeah. Tom. Well, as I was gonna say, Leah, you just kind of touched on it. <laughs> if, if we put more money on longevity, then it would take it out of the money that we can put in salary. We already have a pretty nice dollar amount if you compare what our longevity pay is to other uh, districts that are in our comparables. Um, and so to make it so that the most number of teachers can get the highest raise, we did not put money into that longevity pay. Um, the same with like co-curricular only got a 0.5%. Um, again, it's because we really wanted to put all of the, as much of the money as we could onto salary. And we were able to get, um, prior to this uh, the ratification of hopefully of this vote uh, is we didn't have any longevity um, unless you had your master's, no matter how many years you've been in the district. So um, we were able to get a thousand in each of those lanes. And that's something that we can uh, in future contracts, hopefully improve. The next question is, was the gray area discussed at all? Yes. If <laughs> Four days. At length. At length. At length. Hours. Always. Uh, and so the, I think the reason um, we did not we did not open up the gray area, we had talked about uh, opening the entire thing up. We talked about uh, adding one level each year is the way the district was costing that against us was extremely expensive and punitive towards any other types of in, uh, improvements that we could have done. So in to balance that out, I think the, the, the language that we got to remove academic partners, also adding the double... Um, masters is going to be a much better way uh for people to to increase their salaries uh as if, as they stay in um hopefully stay as a teacher in our district 196 um let's see uh the next question is i don't understand the four percent and the two percent we apologize some of us in, on this call have been negotiating for 30 years and have lived in this world for so long that we forget not everyone else understands. So um, the percentages are the percent that we add on to the salary schedule that increases your salary each year. So if we say 4%, if you took your old salary schedule or your old salary and multiplied by 1.04, that would be your new salary. Um, and then in the second year of the contract, you take your first increase and um, you take your first increase and multiply that by 1.02. And that gives you your next your next salary. The, I just, 
Yeah. What I was referring to is that there's two different ones. Like, how did that come about? Like, there's the four and oh. four, and then there's this other group of people. It's two and two, but that bump in the salary. Oh, been got there it. Forever. Like, what is going on? Where all of a sudden they're saying, "Nope, nope, we're gonna change this. Not everybody gets," you know. Thank you. I guess to me, that was super confusing. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Yep. So thank you, Kelly. That clarifies your question quite a bit for me. In our contract, in step five, we have what's called a jump step. Well, I don't know if that's what it's really called, but that's what we call it. For some, uh, for those of you who've been around a really long time, about 25 years ago, we cut three steps off the salary schedule, steps one, two, and three, and everyone moved to four. And at that time, that created a big jump. So there's a really big salary increase at step when you go from step four to step five. Um, and so when we just happen to have, so one of the things we brainstormed in trying to get as money spread out as much as we could across the salary schedule, one of the things we did was look at those four cells. It's just those four cells, step five, MA, MA plus 30, MA plus 60. And I'm, there's four cells and I've only said three, but. um, So it's not going forward from there. It's, it's not all the one. Oh, it's okay. just, I was just those four that. cells. Oh, okay. That didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Okay. And all so right. if you happen to be in that cell, you're going to say, I didn't get 4%. Yep. You're right. But if you actually calculate it, I think they're getting like an 11% jump yeah. still. They would have gotten a 16% pay raise. They're only going to get 11% pay raise. So, and that's for everyone's education. That's a really important thing to understand that when you are on the salary schedule making steps, you're making way more than a 4% increase because those steps already have between a 4 and a 6% increase. So that 4% is on top of that. The 4% and 4% really only applies to those of us who are at step 13 and don't have any more steps to take. So then you really only get 4%. And then, of course, if you take away increased insurance premiums, it's less than 4%. Um, and, and the only thing I would say to that is, you know, there are many contracts across our state where there are 30 or 40 steps on the salary schedule. So you never make $100,000 till you've been in a district 30 years. If you get a master's plus 60 and teach in this district 13 years, you're at $100,000 and make that $100,000 for, for as long as you teach here. So that's why our contract over a career lifetime is the best contract in the state because you make that money early and you make it throughout your career but it really sucks every two years when you don't get the big steps that steps and lanes get. Sorry, I, I can't stop talking. No, I think that's uh, I, I think that's good. The other thing is that when the district is giving us this pile of money that Leah was talking about, a lot of that's already eaten up because they're already calculating how many people are moving down. That's a big chunk. Anybody that's a new hire in moving through there, that's already taken away. And so that's a that's a big pile of that money. And so what that's whatever's left is where we can put on new increases in the first and second year, what we can do on in health insurance, what we can do on longevity, what we can do in co-curricular and the like. Um, so the next question that I see here is if we vote no, is there a potential that the 4% and 4% would decrease? I, I I don't know how they would know it wouldn't pass again. So I I think it uh, the honest the, the honest answer I'm going to give is no. It will not go down. It will go up. But the question will be it. But and at that point, then the district's going to have to start making budget adjustments and um, where those cuts come from. We'll be teaching. You know, we don't we don't get to make those decisions and 86 percent of the school district budget is our salaries. So in order to, you know, and I don't know. You know, I don't. So I, we've I don't, yeah. we go had a mediation before, but we've gone for language issues, right? We've never gone when we haven't agreed with the amount of money. So we don't really know what it would look like. Uh, so maybe the four and four percent would stay there or maybe it would go up a little bit, but then something else would have to come out. 
I didn't, like Kate said, I don't think that the district, even on a no vote of four, four and four, is going to start then just opening their billfold and saying, oh, then you need more money to settle the contract. I, they may increase it a little bit, but I can't imagine that it's going to be enough to just add on to the percentages. Uh, like Christine said in the beginning, when they offered us four and two, they said that was the best that we could do. This is the first time, except for the time when we were doing zero and zero, that we had gone back to the board and asked for saying the parameters aren't large enough. We're never going to be able to sell this contract to our members. Uh, we need more money. The only other time we did that was like eight years ago when, when we were in a freeze and um, the top step was going to actually go back because T go backwards because TRA was going up a, a few percentages. So we were able to put some money in there. But I, I a no vote does not, in my mind, doesn't guarantee that we're going to get a higher percentage uh, on salary schedule. And I guess that's more an opinion. I know there's nobody has a crystal ball, right? Uh, the next question says, can you say how much you initially asked for? And I, I think we answered that five and five. Um, with 10%, 10.5% and 5% on health insurance. Uh, are we able to speak on what you asked for regarding parental leave prior to the law change in uh, January 2026? Absolutely. We asked for what Northfield got. We wanted to have eight weeks of paid leave um, for um, for all our uh, people who needed uh, paid family medical leave. Um, I think, uh, but again, that costs money. The district says if we're going to pay people when they're not working, we at least have to cost against the contract how much that sub is for eight weeks. Um, and that's part of the problem of being a super large district in Northfield. I talked to their president. You know, they could look at their 300 members and say, oh, here are the 100 women who are of childbearing age who might want to have a child and this is how much it would cost for a sub every day and we can afford to do that in our district you know we might be looking at a thousand women or or you know it's not only for women giving birth but um and when they said no to that we brainstorm again this is a topic that we spent hours and hours and hours on trying to find um, a middle road, something we could do. I mean, there were um, lots of unique and creative ideas out there to help um, to, to help improve our parental leave. And again, at the end of the day, it's always it always comes down to where do you want to put your money? And it it was so expensive um, that. And, you know, it's going to be expensive for the state of Minnesota, too, in 2026, but everyone in the state of Minnesota has to pay into that system on an employee tax that, that will be added um, or, yeah. Um, and in our case, it means just the 2,300 members have to pay to, to cover that for everyone else. So it's not spread out as far, so it's a bigger cost on each individual member. Next question is, is there a place for us to see the rules of how negotiation work and what is allowed to be shared and when by the district or the DQ reps? Well, that information we tried to pass out during um, our negotiations. I know Kate had posted in all of her reviews um, what how interest-based collective bargaining works. And so what we do when we come together is um, we honestly sit at a really big table together and the we share what our issues are and then we share what our interests behind those issues are. Um, and then we honestly brainstorm as many ideas as we can that solve what our issue is and then meet our interests. Um, and the way that interest-based is set up is that it just stays within that group. Um, so it honestly builds sort of trust between the group. Um, we're all working towards that common goal. The problem is we can't share that information. Um, but I feel like for me, at least having done now many rounds of negotiation, we get a way better uh, final outcome. Our discussions are better. I think that the district is more willing to look, you know, outside the box, so to speak, at solutions. The downfall is we can't share our information until we're done. But now that we're done, 
we can talk about the things that we talked about. And I think what's important to note too, what Kate just mentioned when she was talking about um, the parental leave issue is any topic that comes up that has money attached to it gets taken from the total package. So that's always that's always there is like anytime we have a conversation that's going to involve anything to do with financials, it's costed against our package. So it's costed against how much they're willing to give. And that, so that's always on the table. Like The next question is from, uh, can you clarify the changes around the MA degree? And I don't know, Bethany, are you talking about the um, double master's degree? If you can pop on and yeah, I guess I just, I wanted to make sure if I was understanding that right. So that's, if you come in with a master's degree, they still look at your credits. So you could start at MA 45 or MA, and then that's something additional. Okay. I just, Correct. for, I'm an OT in the district. Yep. And I, <laughs> Great I, question. So, so I just wanted to clarify, because I was like, we won't get OTs if we're all going back to just the nope. master's. Nope. No. It, it, what it really is, is it's a second master's degree. So right now you can get to a master's lane by getting a master's degree, right? And then you got to, to make your full earning potential, you got to get to master's plus 60. So, you know, there are lots of options. Well, now there's a lot more options because now you can do learner's edge, all 60 credits if you want. You could get um, a specialist degree. You could get a PhD. You could... Okay. Um, but the thing that we added this year is if you can go back and get a second master's degree, which, by the way, is not 60 credits. But you can jump all the way to master's plus 60, even though it's you haven't taken 60 credits. If you get a second master's degree, you can jump to MA plus 60 um, instead of those other things. The reason uh, this is was a good deal for both the district and the teachers is that um, at the high school level, we need teachers to teach college in the schools. And for them to teach college in the schools, they have to have a master's degree in their subject. So if they have a master's degree in technology, educational technology, they can't teach that college in the schools class. If they're a biology teacher, they have to have a master's degree in biology. So if a teacher comes in, has already gotten their master's degree in you know, educational technology, they want to teach college in the schools. The school wants them to teach that. They go back, they get a master's degree in biology. They can jump all the way to MA plus 60. Next question has to do with the percentages uh, increase for administrators ended up. And I don't think we've figured out if they've uh, settled. Uh, next question is, can you clarify 403B matching? If the matching is increased, how are we able to do that retroactively? Uh, they will retroactively put it in your 403B. Just like every check when they send it off, they'll probably in that retro track put instead of putting whatever it is now, it'll be $10 more times the six it's, you know, eight paychecks we haven't finished. So the money will just end up in your 403B. And then uh, next question is, is it possible to have a retro pay be separate check versus being added to the regular paycheck? Depends on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> the, reality, well, the reality is, yes, it is possible, but no, we can't get the district to do that. The best we could do was to get the... Uh, Payments at least spread out over three different checks, so it wasn't all one huge check. It is also my understanding that on the 29th and 15th checks, they're going to, I am not a payroll expert, but they're going to do something to try and minimize the tax costs. My understanding is the way our system is set up, if you get a retro check that has for $20,000, the computer says, ooh, you make $20,000 every two weeks and taxes you at that really high tax bracket. My understanding is there's a way to manually control that so that doesn't happen. Um, but I don't know exactly what that looks like. Uh, new language uh, states that newer teachers do not have to contribute the full amount of 1610 to their 403B to receive a match. If they could only afford to contribute 500, will the full 1610 still be deducted from their H HCSP retirement payout uh, if and when they retire from the district? Yes. <laughs> 
who are the school board members on the negotiations team? Jackie Magnuson and Corey Johnson. If we voted no and asked for more, where would that money come from, in your opinion? The 5% fund balance cuts to school school budget and teachers? Um, they will below the 5%. The That's school, a, yep. The school board has a policy that they will maintain a 5% fund balance. So it will not come from the fund balance. Um, it, in, in my opinion, they will they will start cutting budgets. Yeah, or programs in the district. Correct. Would the district ever consider off buying out to, uh, to address older teachers who are at the top of their salary schedule paired with their longevity? who are extremely expensive part of the ISD 196 payroll budget, freeing up salary dollars to put uh, toward better salary increases. Yes, and then they would ch cost that against us, which they did, uh, what, 10 years ago? Yes, yeah, so that's, so when we, the last time we did a payout, that payout, I think it was $10,000 for experienced teachers to leave. That $10,000, every teacher that took it that got deducted from our settlement package. So the people who are still working paid for the people to retire. Um, and we will never agree to that again. And so the district doesn't have money to do it on their own. And um, if you're not aware, there's a teacher shortage. And so right now they're more interested in having teachers in the building than letting teachers go. And we're when we're they're hiring new teachers, it's not fresh out of college. That's often experienced teachers. So you're, there's not that huge saving from the high salary to the low salary uh, that was traditionally what we used to be able to count on. Uh, we do track that data over the last three years. The average new teacher in this district has 11 years experience and a master's degree. We steal teachers from other districts. We don't hire newbies out of college. Uh, Michelle says, it sounds like the board needs to hear from us and a no vote would send that message. How do we encourage people that this is the case prior to voting? Um, that I'm going to have to leave that question to you. The negotiations team and the executive board took a position of support um, of this settlement, which means we can't actively work against it. Um, we absolutely respect everyone's right to vote for themselves um what they think the right thing is to do and none of us are going to be hurt or upset if this gets voted down but it is the best we thought we could do and the best we could bring to you and if it's voted down we'll go back and see if we can do more but uh as an as an or as leaders in the organization we can't actively work against it why would we be cutting teachers when i've heard the isd 196 levy property taxes have gone up 28 percent over the past two years. That, you're absolutely right. I, the community should be furious. Um, but I, it, I, my bottom line here is, and I know people get mad at me when I do this, but I'm just going to be honest. This is not a District 196 problem. This is a society problem. No one wants to raise their taxes to pay what it costs to educate children in this state. If the district had more money, they would give it to us. If, you know, uh, so um, you're right. And and we try to go out and um, get levies and get money from our community. And our community is very supportive. Uh, we also don't levy at the maximum amount. So there's still more money that the district could get from their community. But the community is probably getting tired of, you know, parent parent paying more in property tax, um, which, you know, started in 2008 with Palenti and Jesse Ventura and shifting the onus of educational spending from the state to property taxes. Uh, Judy, can you reword your comment into a question for us, please? Oh, I understand it. Oh, you do? Okay. So, yes, there are contracts out there. Burnsville's, their contract language says... Uh, the district will pay 75% of the premium. Our contract says a dollar amount, so we have to renegotiate that dollar amount every year. Hey, uh, will you tell us what you think the question was? The question says, the so the admin contract says the district will pay 50% of the insurance increase, which is what the district offered us by saying that, you know, raise 
So you can word a contract for healthcare language many different ways. If we said the district will pay 75% of our health insurance premium, then even when we don't settle a contract and the premium goes up, the district has to pay 75% of it. That's awesome language. I'd love to have it. But it gets costed against our package and no one would get a pay increase then. Yeah. Burnsville has fought like hell to keep that language. But if you've looked at their salary increases lately, I don't want to be them either. So it, everything's always a choice. And yes, I doubt it will. I doubt it will change. And negotiating uh, sped caseloads is now in statutes. Other districts around us have had lower starting caseloads and pay over load stipends. Was this an attempted negotiation issue? Was a stipend for sped teachers a negotiated issue? Yes and yes. Uh, next question. <laughs> what <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know if there was a follow up. But... I was just going to say we we yeah. It was hours there... and hours and hours. Yeah. Is there any talk about having general PTO instead of sick and personal leave time like other professions? Who on the team would like to take that sticky wicket? I got it. Well, hold on. Kelly looks like she's about to say something. I would say that we have talked about PTO every single year that I've been a negotiator every contract, except really for this one. We've talked Ad about nauseum. five contracts in a row. And can and you explain it why it's not good for- It doesn't go anywhere members. because our retirement, our severance package is tied to our, um, our sick days. And there has to be a sunset time period where those people who have accumulated can use, and then you'd have to start. And we have difficulty finding that. Anyone add to add, wanna add? Uh, blackout. That's the other thing is, you know, I, if we, if we thought the district would say you can have your days or maybe even a smaller amount and there, there's not going to be any blackout, then we might, that might be something that we would look into or maybe put in, uh, have a subcommittee look at, but we know that they're still going to say you can't take these certain days off. Well, and when we looked at comparable, comparable PTO time, it was far less than what we get right now far less days than what we get right now for sick days with our personal days. And, and the I others talked about it. At Sorry, Christine, say that again. Just going to say it. We've talked about it for more hours than my children have been alive for the last four contracts. And, and really to, to be open and fair and thorough, our, our profession is different from other professions. If you're a website designer and you decide you just don't want to work tomorrow, you can work on the website the day after. In our career, the kids show up every day, whether we're there or not. And so allowing people, I know we all want more flexibility. We all want more flexibility, but also in an age where we don't have enough subs, um, people taking time off often affects their colleagues next door because we're having to, to cover the class that isn't there. Um, and the other piece I would say is with the new earned and sick, sick and safe time law, there are expanded reasons and uh, for taking sick leave. So, um, you know, so that helps a little bit too. And we've talked in the past and the district has said, yeah, we'll give you PTO, but we'll give you 10 days. Yeah, and we have seven. 15 days right now. So their concern is if we give everyone PTO and they can take it whenever they want for whatever they want, we're worried about how many teachers are not going to be at school every day when kids are here. So it has never been a good enough deal. Um, you know, we're not going to trade 15 days when you have to jump through some hoops for 10 days so you can take them whenever you want. Which just my just my personal thought here, which might piss somebody off. We're contracted to work 185 days. We can take 15 off. If a child misses ten, uh, this many days, they get reported for educational neglect. <laughs> so well, we, did I mean, get a win, we did get a win with the language um, 
the blackout period at the end, I thought we got a pretty good win on that, which I don't, that's not in a question, but being able to take more days in the spring that we used to not be able to take, but you will be able to now. Right. What, what is, is the, end? oh, sorry. <laughs> what is the end game for a strike? How long could one actually continue before the Minnesota government steps in? Not necessarily encouraging this, simply curious. What happens if the district refuses to increase? I have to be 100% uh, uh, honest. I have no idea. We've never gotten this far. We've never been. Uh, I do have a strike sign in my office from 1989 when the Rosemont Feder of Te Federation of Teachers almost went out on strike. Uh, but I don't know. You know, I think our community would put it. Uh, would put enough pressure on the district. You know, parents would be mad enough that their kids are out of schools that I believe you know, I don't I don't think the Minnesota government can step in, you know, local school boards control their schools, um, you know, so I think, you know, I, I don't know exactly how that would that how that would work out. Um, I do know Aaron Van Morleham, are you still on this call? He's our Education Minnesota field staff and I and deals with lots of districts, so he must have had to leave. Um, so, I mean, that was, you know, that is something we would dig into as soon as um, if, a, if a no vote happens, um, you know, the district can do what is called a last and final offer. And then, you know, if mediation doesn't work, you can either strike or you can go to arbitration. But an arbitration is like a third party person who just decides and you have to do whatever they decide. So um, I again, in full honesty, I I never want to strike. I mean, I will consider it, but I I, you know, don't spend a lot of time planning and thinking about it. And so the next question was, uh, if we go to mediation, is it binding mediation mediation and do you have an explanation of binding versus non-binding? And that's why Aaron would be good if he was on this call to answer that probably. Yeah, we all experienced mediation, which is we were reminiscing the other day that we went to mediation about six years ago and it was so frustrating. Both sides agreed to leave the mediation office and come back to DQ and finish it on our own because the mediators were so crazy. So I don't know the answer to that question. I'm happy to get that answer and put it out in a DQ review. Uh, Was there discussion on flexibility with personal days, like being able to use them on non-student contact days? Hours and hours and hours. Yeah. Yep. We have yeah. gone back and forth. We've gone back and forth with the district because they tell us they want teachers in the classroom with students. So then when we come to these staff development days and we say this would be a time for teachers to be able to take a day and not affect their the students. Um, and then they say, but the things that you're going to learn are so important that we need to have you there. And I, like I said before, we come up with options and we had thrown out options like maybe you can only take one, like you can't miss all of them, but you can take one for a, something special. And the district is very resistant to changing their minds on staff development days. And we push and we push and we push and have not made progress on those. Sophia, come here, try this. If there is a no vote, the admin responds with budget cuts, staffing reduction. How is that student centered? And is that an empty threat? It no, is. I'm he has to come from somewhere. <laughs> the money, I mean, it's not student, it's not student centered, and no, it is not an empty threat. The money, you know, they got to find the money somewhere. As Christine said, I just repeated her. Are the severe staffing shifts from the decisions that the district is making with regard to the Read Act and a number of people who will probably be put on unrequ unrequested? Factored, factored into the staffing budget. So for those of you who are unaware, there have been some new jobs posted at the elementary and some old jobs 
and some other job programs and jobs that we're not doing anymore. I do believe um, everyone is hoping that no one will be put on unrequested leave of absence. Um, when someone, if you are tenured in this district, you are owed a job in this district for which you are licensed and qualified. Um, every probationary teacher would have to be let go first before someone was put on unrequested leave of absence, although it is a little tricky if you are a part-time um, a part-time employee that doesn't want to go to full-time or can't or, you know, they're not always. Um, so um, I would say no if someone had to be put on unrequested leave of absence. Um, that was probably not factored into the staffing budget. And I think probably because the district doesn't is hoping that that's not going to happen. Can and you, that's can I, can I sure. Okay. Um, just because there are, I know it's not a lot of people, so I'm sorry to take up time from other people, but those of us who are part time, it doesn't appear that there's going to be jobs available. So even though even though we may want to and we are applying for other positions we there was just we were just told there were 60 people that interviewed for 19 positions right so it, the numbers are not in my favor or our favor and so um all of this is fact i mean i'm thinking about all of this is there's a group of us that may not have other options but will be placed on unrequested leave i don't see another way around it and I would hope that's not the case, but that's a that's going to be money that the district. So when when the I, I'm kind of going all over, but when we talk about if we don't if we increase, um, it's going to come from somebody's pay, right? Well, there's already a chunk of us who are probably going to be handing over our salaries. I hope not, but I don't see any other options, and um, that comes into this whole discussion of. All of that is factored into our mindset as well for those of us on that end of this. That's a I'm I'm tr I'm trying to figure out how to answer. I totally understand everything you're saying. Um Yeah. So I think the easiest way I can say it is no, they haven't considered it. And 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 that's one of our biggest complaints is they'll say, you know, we got to cost this against you. Like if we add a personal day, you got to take 185 times $2,300 or I'm sorry, $185 times 2,300 teachers, because that's the maximum amount it could cost. When we go back and say how many actually got paid out for all their days or how many took them all or the district never goes back and actually finds out how much it act our contract actually costs. So that's why I don't believe they have calculated um, that. And in their minds, they would say, we want to offer you a job. We want you to have that job. So we're not going to consider it a, a savings in the budget if if we can't find a job for you. Next nope. question is please explain. Oh, sorry. No, my bad. That's your job. <laughs> please explain when the large insurance claim the district continues to pay off from years ago will be paid down and then perhaps resulting in a reduction in health insurance premiums moving forward. Uh, so the first thing I would say is L LMK, if you're still on and know something I don't know, um, I don't believe, well, I believe our insurance claims continue to run hot and furious in this district. I don't believe our problem is something that happened years ago. It is something that's happening every, it is happening every day in this local. We are, our premium, in, we are a self-insured district which means we have a trust fund that our premiums are paid into to pay the premiums out of. And when our claims outrun our trust fund with millions of dollars in it, we have to raise premiums to put more money in that trust fund to cover the claims. So um, by no fault of anyone, you know, I mean, that's what insurance is. We all get together and we pay in to cover the people 
who maybe couldn't afford a huge doctor bills on their own, but um, for the 6,000 employees in this district, claims are um, very high. Let's be honest, the whole freaking healthcare system is broken. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jacob doesn't have a question. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, Aaron, is the retroactive pay considered partial 2023 income? I know it's more of a tax question, but unsure if that came up. Nope. With the proposed <laughs> changes in the school calendar that were proposed on the February 12th board meeting, we now have three more days ineligible for personal leave, including two of the most popular days annually. Is there any possible uh, post-contract negotiation, negotiations, MOU or something to work on this issue? Uh, yes, still working on it. The, the the tricky part now, well, A, I just want you all to know that I had proposed my own school calendar that did not put those days on that day. And imagine it. I don't know how but fast it got that it hit the recycling bin, but uh, I had proposed a different calorie, a different uh, school calendar that would not do that. I have been in conversations with the district to really work on that. The tricky part right now, um, if you're not aware of the READ Act, all 1,300, um, there's about 1,300 staff next year that need to be trained in literacy training, and it's required by the state. And um, a lot of it is asynchronous, so there is a possibility to possibly say, um, you know, if you if you do the if you do the training before the personal day, then you can take the personal day. Um, I never give up hope, but um, in all honesty, our district office is still kind of stuck in 1950. If you're not in the building, you're not working, and if I can't see you, you're not working. So we're trying. Um, let's see here. Uh, recently learned that the DO team was originally open to teachers being able to take a personal day on PD and they came back to tables saying that the principals are not okay with it. How can they go back to principals with questions about being, about what is being negotiated if DQ can't come back to teachers and ask questions? I think we have, there are principals on the team. On our, on the, on the districts and quotations team, there are principals on the team. Right. I think the real question is, if their side is going back and talking to people, why aren't we going back and asking our members? And I I think we have to talk about that. And then Mona has a, a fun question. I'm not going to read out loud because it's just going to be yes or no. Uh, next question is, can you provide a brief overview of nurse salary schedule? I can. Um, so... Uh, education for all of you on here who are not nurses. Um, our nurses have traditionally always been paid as hourly employees. Very few of them were eight hour a day employees and their pay used to stink. For the last 20, 25 years, we've been working really hard. Our ultimate goal is to get all employees, all members of DQ on the same salary schedule. What is happening with nurses this year is they will continue to be hourly employees this year. Their hourly play is close, but not equivalent to teacher pay. And next year after July 1st, they will become salaried employees and their salaries will be close, but not equitable to teacher salaries. Um, again, it was uh, quite a large cost um, to move every, if we were to take all the, well, there's lots of problems. The nurses don't have a gray area in their contract. So we would have to put the gray area back in our contract in order to move the nurses over. Um, I think the shortest answer is, um, that our goal is to have every, everyone in our unit is a professional educator and they should all be paid the same amount on the same salary schedule. So we're working towards getting nurses there. The side, um, the, the tricky part of that is when nurses, currently when nurses work outside of their contract day, they get their hourly pay. Whereas teachers work outside their contract day, you get 33 bucks an hour. 
So when the nurses move to a salaried schedule, to a salary, to a salary, they will also just like teachers only get $35 an hour. <laughs> so, however, our nurses only have a 10 step salary schedule. And, you know, I was explaining to a nurse last night, they were like, the teachers have 13. And I'm like, actually, 10 is a better deal. You're making more money faster. And the nurses' uh, longevity steps are sooner in their career than the teachers are. So we're just trying to make incremental steps towards improving our um, uh, improving our contract for our nurses. Um, and we did add, they used to only be able to go up to a master's degree. We added all the way to an MA plus 60. So a nurse could go back, take some learning at learner's edge courses or some other college credits, uh, make a lane change and make up for that difference. They might lose an hourly pay for summer work. If a counselor becomes unable to work all of the five days added to the contract, will they have to take a sick day? Will those summer days be paid in September? Um, I yes, you would have if you cannot work all five days, you would have to use a sick day or a personal day. Um, and I'm not sure when those days will be paid. That I is an excellent question. I think we talked about that as being what being a pretty flexible number of days. Yes. Some teachers, some counselors have a lot of workload in June. Some of it have it in July. Some of it have it in August at the high school level. It depends on registrations as they are coming in. And I don't believe that we talked about that as being June 20th through the 25th. I think that that was kind of a, a more flexible five day period according to workload. Mm -hmm. and we um, but we can't start till July 1st. That's right. <laughs> July 1st of 2024. So we're not, we can't do June when we would like to do some June days. Uh, yeah. did, who, who told you that? Well, the contract, it, it's in yeah. the language. It says July 1st, 2024 is yeah. when it begins. No, that you can start in June. We just, the days are agreed upon between the counselor and the and the administrator. So you're right. It's the way it's worded in our TA, but that was not the intent of the language. Okay, that would be good. Yeah. Yep. For people to know. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. How do we voice our concerns about adding one of the three day, three days of PD not being able uh, not being next to spring break? This takes away from teachers being able to find reasonable price costs to take our kids on. Um, one might align with our kids' spring break, so we aren't taking them out for a full week. School board and superintendent, email them. Um, with the second master's getting you to MA60, does that count for teachers who are already in the middle of working on their second master's? Um, so That's there is a process to it. I think it'll be announced. I think we have agreed that if you already have a second master's, it would not apply. Um, and if you're currently enrolled in a second master's, I believe there will be a window for you to get that um, in and approved with the district. As it is right now to do a master's program any, or any graduate, you have to have each course approved. My understanding is that in the future, you'll be able to get your entire master's program approved with one form. And I think what's going to happen is that um, there'll be a small grandfathering period where if you're currently working on your second master's, you can get that approval to make it happen um, before the contract settles. I would say right this minute, don't rush and finish before any of that information comes out. <laughs> I agree. Uh, can you speak on uh, more on the district being, being self insured for health insurance and how we landed there versus more traditional options. How does health partners factor into this and how do they, or do they just administer how our money gets spent? Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know exactly when it happened. We became self-insured because it was cheaper. We were trying to keep costs down. Um, so that's why we became self-insured. Um, health partners is what's called a third-party administer administrator. So they're not backing the program with they're not backing our insurance program with money, but they're the ones who do the paperwork and 
they're the experts on doing claims and EOBs and all that stuff. So they do the administrative part of it, but they are not putting the money up to, to pay the claims. The district actually puts the money up. Um, I am excited. Uh, for those of you who've been around for a while, Education Minnesota has pushed for years for a statewide health insurance plan for teachers. If you think it's bad in District 196, try try Black Duck, Minnesota. They, I mean, we have teachers out there who do not have health insurance through their district. They have to go through um, UCARE or it, it's, it's just not offered. Um, it, to, I was t talking to Shelly Munson, our HR director today. You know, lots of companies do... Um, Lots of companies say, if your spouse can get health insurance at their work, you cannot take our health insurance. That is a way we could bring down health insurance costs in this district, where we would say, we're not going to cover your spouse if they can get health insurance at their own job. So there are lots of options out there. I um, And I'm, I'm happy to hear that Education Minnesota has put it back in their legislative agenda to try and get wide health care for teachers, putting all 90,000 teachers in the state on one health care plan would be uh, beneficial for all of us. So that's it. That's it, all we have for uh, questions. So thanks for joining us.